if you ever watched my disturbing Wikipedia pages video, you might recall the morbid police sketches of murder victims who were never identified. The truly unsettling element was the fact that the images didn't quite make it to the other side of the uncanny valley. They were the ghostly portraits of people who were once alive like you and I, but who we know nothing about. This was them, but not really. Taking that one step further is this post on Reddit. Nine months ago, user When Machines Cry posted a link on the site. The link takes you to a set of police sketches, this time of serial killers and other criminals, who, to this day, haven't been caught. Along with each picture is a description of the suspect and their crimes. The Connecticut River Killer, thought to be responsible for the murder of at least seven women in the Claremont, New Hampshire, and River Valley areas. Each female had been stabbed as many as 29 times. His final victim, a pregnant woman, was stabbed multiple times and left for dead. Miraculously, she survived and made it to her car. As she drove off to find help, she inadvertently caught up with her attacker, who was driving in the car in front of her. She managed to escape and tell the police everything she could. After that, the killer's activity in the area came to a sudden stop, but he was never apprehended. The Burgershef Massacre Suspects, a duo that murdered four Burgershef employees in 1978, all for the grand total of $500. It wasn't a simple robbery gone wrong, however. In fact, the police thought the employees had taken the money themselves and gone out partying, since there were no traces of them at the restaurant. In reality, they had all been kidnapped by the two unknowns. Two days after going missing, all four of their bodies were found 20 miles away in a field. Two of them had been executed by a shot to the head, one had been stabbed, and one was beaten to death with a chain. All four were between the ages of 16 and 20. Seb Quinn's Abductor In January 2000, a man called Zeb Quinn disappeared under mysterious circumstances. This woman is believed to be one of those responsible. Quinn was out with a friend, Rob Owens, when he received a call. Owens doesn't know what the call was about, but Quinn became frantic, hopped in his car, and left in a hurry. He was never seen again, but his car was. Witnesses described the driver to the police, and this was the reconstruction they came up with. Two weeks later, the car was found in a parking lot, next to the hospital where Quinn's mother worked. Inside was a live Labrador mix puppy, along with several empty bottles of alcohol, and a jacket that didn't belong to Quinn. Strangely, a pair of lips were drawn on the back windshield. Bible John A man that murdered three mothers in Glasgow by strangling them with their own nylons. He would go out to a local club called Barulam Ballroom, meet unsuspecting women, gain their trust by dancing with them the whole night, and then head back to their place. All of their bodies were found near their respective homes the morning after they'd been out. The only person to get a good look at him was the final victim's sister, who had shared a taxi with the two of them after their night at the club. She said that he constantly quoted numerous scriptures from the Bible leading to his well-known nickname, Bible John. This is one of the most talked about cases in Scottish history, and so many Glaswegian men were taken in for questioning and DNA swabs that they were actually given official cards to prove they weren't the killer. One suspect was the target of a massive media smear campaign, which led to him committing suicide. He was later proved to be completely innocent. Some believe that the killer was one of the police officers working the case, though that's only hearsay, and at this point, it seems unlikely that the real identity of Bible John will ever be known. That's only a handful of the cases the Post covers. In my eyes, it's somewhat unsettling to see the reconstructed faces of these psychopathic killers, unsafe in the knowledge that they could still be living amongst us.
Lake City Quiet Pills is a Reddit mystery that started seven years ago, when a user called 26 made a post about the passing of his friend, another Redditor with the username Religion of Peace. Real name, Milo. Apparently, he had a heart attack at the age of 79. 26 was the old man's only companion, and he described him as a miserable bastard he was going to miss. Their friendship centered around the fact that 26 provided the space for a website that Milo ran, a website known as That Old Guy's Image Host. Altogether, the post is pretty sad, but it's simple enough, and on surface value seems to just be a small memorial to an old chum that didn't have much of a life outside of Reddit. The replies are mostly from other users paying their respects, since Religion of Peace, Milo, was a big part of the online community. Digging through his account history, it became apparent that Religion of Peace was a moderator for a subreddit, and was also a World War II veteran. He wrote about a number of his wartime experiences in great detail on various threads. The essence of this mystery, though, lies in his website. You won't find anything special there, it's pretty much just full of porn images. However, a number of people decided to take a closer look at it, and a few strange things came to light. Firstly, despite being called that old guy's image host, the site had the strange domain name LakeCityQuietPills.com. On top of that, secret coded messages could be found in the HTML, just a string of seemingly meaningless information. Over time, these messages changed, suggesting that the site was using encrypted hashes. As a result, a lot of people thought this to be some sort of internet numbers station, but others had a different idea. Decrypting the messages, it became apparent that the codes weren't meaningless after all. They seemed to be a way for people to communicate with each other covertly, a way for Milo to send out key information to some unknown associates. As you can see, the messages are rather cryptic. So what were these hidden messages about? Who were they meant for? And what exactly was the meaning behind the phrase, Lake City Quiet Pills? As it turns out, Religion of Peace was more than a simple World War II veteran. He apparently had some kind of expertise in the field of killing people. This, mixed with the suspicious content of the hidden messages, have led many to believe that the site was being used by hitmen to pass along vital information about specific jobs, using party as a code word. As for the phrase, Lake City Quiet Pills, a lot of people now believe it to have a more sinister meaning. Several theories are floating around on the site, suggesting that Religion of Peace might have been some kind of online organiser of hitmen who spent his downtime browsing Reddit. Some think he'd advertise available jobs, give out specific client requests, and take commissions for his role. Some also believe that in an effort to keep him quiet, his associates may have decided to shut him up permanently. The old man was pretty vocal online, and could have compromised the entire operation. Milo may have been forced to fake his death and stay off of online forums, or may have literally been silenced. There's so much information out there on this mystery that I can't really go into all of the details here. If you feel like doing a little internet sleuthing yourself, you can find all sorts of threads about it. Admittedly, it's a bit of a wild story, but I definitely suggest checking it out further in your free time, and coming to your own conclusions. If nothing else, it's a disturbing set of posts. Seven months ago, one Reddit user got a notification from their smart home app in the middle of the night, saying, Your doorbell has detected a visitor. Checking the camera that monitored the entrance to their home, they were relieved to find that nobody was there. The next night, the user was again awoken by multiple notifications. It was the same message, saying that there was a visitor at the front door. The camera still showed nothing, so the user brushed it off, figuring that a stray animal kept setting off the sensor. 
On the third night, they continued to receive notifications, but presumed it was nothing serious. Then, at 4.07am, their phone buzzed one more time. They checked the front door camera, and saw this. Less than two weeks ago, a post was made on Ask Reddit, posing one simple question. What's the scariest way to die? Well, I'm sure you have your own answers for that. Everyone does. So it stands to reason there were a bunch of detailed responses. Some designed to make you laugh, and some downright horrible to think about. What I found to be the most disconcerting responses, however, were the ones that described the worst ways in which people had actually died in reality. Many of them are truly gruesome to read about, and will probably make you want to never leave the house again. In my eyes though, the worst one that came up was the story of John Jones, an American spelunker. Caving's a personal phobia of mine, but no matter what personally terrifies you, this one has to be pretty high on everyone's scariest way to go list. Back in 2009, Jones was out exploring caves in Utah County. While checking out an unmapped section of Nutty Putty Cave, the 26-year-old fell headfirst down a narrow tunnel and became trapped, upside down, unable to move. There was no way to wriggle through the tunnel to freedom either, as it led to a dead end. To give you an idea of just how tightly stuck he was, the tunnel was about the width of a washing machine opening. With his arms clamped by his side, John was unable to even try to push himself back up the passage. Even if he could, it would have been futile. The passage he was trapped in wasn't straight. There were curves. As such, his feet ended up hitting the ceiling of the small crevice where he was now lodged. For hours, John would remain at an almost 90 degree angle, completely locked in place. Rescuers were alerted by those who were out caving with John. Right now, time was of the essence. Since John was stuck upside down, blood and other fluids were pooling in his head and lungs. What's more, the pressure on his torso from being so tightly wedged in made it extremely hard to breathe. He was constantly gasping for breath, only barely getting enough oxygen to survive. According to Sheriff Sean Roundy, John was trapped in literally the worst spot in the cave. More than a hundred people joined the effort to get him out, and a pulley system was devised to do just that. After hours of trying to reach him, one rescuer was able to secure a rope around John's legs. There was one major problem, though. Because of the position John was trapped in, they'd have to break his legs to even have a chance of getting him out. The shock of which, coupled with being upside down and compressed on the chest area, would likely prove to be fatal. John had been trapped down there for 24 hours at this point, and pulling him out would take a few more hours at least, so there didn't seem to be much choice. Then, disaster. Due to equipment problems, the rope system failed and was no longer an option. Rescuers were now back at square one. They managed to get a police radio down to John, who was able to talk to his wife and family one last time. As the rescuers frantically scrambled to find a way of dislodging him, John became unresponsive, and after being trapped for 27 hours, was pronounced dead. Rescuers were never able to retrieve John's body. The part of the cave where he now rests has simply been sealed off. Now, this is a peculiar one. Just over a month ago, users who used to work in photo development were asked to share the most memorable pictures they had come across on the job. As you can probably imagine, Lots of the replies revolved around strange sexual fetishes. But perhaps the strangest came from a user called Ninesoft, who wrote about an encounter he had back in 1999. He described how one day, he developed a roll of film that had the most convincing pictures of UFOs he had ever seen, and how in several of them, 
there were strange figures standing in a field. He emphasized how convincing these photos were, and how no sci-fi could ever compete with what he saw in them. He then states that the owner of the film roll came back to the store, paid for the service, and got out of there. Now, it's an interesting and unexpected little story, but in any other thread, this post would have probably been lost. That likely would have been the case here, too, had it not been for another user, Bad Alchemist, who simply replied, Was this in Nebraska? Was the dude wearing a blue hat? Turns out that Bad Alchemist had a friend, who, at around about the same time, had similar experiences. The two of them described very similar encounters with a strange man, who had photos developed of unknown creatures, more realistic than even modern day technology could create. The plot only thickened further when another user, Gunkrock Steady, also claimed to have had a similar experience in Broken Bow, Nebraska, describing a mysterious man in a blue hat who had similar pictures developed at his workplace. When he came to pick up his pictures, some of them had come out onto the counter, and I saw what I thought was an alien in a field, with a long tree line in the background. But because it's a little far-fetched, I tried to think nothing of it. But the whole thing really stuck with me, because he was wearing this nice blazer with a blue matching hat, and he was perspirating a lot, and seemed to be in a rush. The whole thing left me feeling weird at the time, and now, reading your experience that occurred not far from me in Broken Bow, plus Bad Alchemist's experience. It's really bizarre. Despite no longer living in Nebraska, the three users have apparently agreed to meet in person to discuss their past experiences, and try to work out what this whole thing was about. As of right now, there's been no new developments. If that changes, I'll be sure to keep you posted. Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. So I hope you enjoyed these uh, posts. I don't really like to cover all ground which other users have uh, talked about before, so I hope they were mostly new to you. I can't make too many of this type of video, because there's only so many posts to go around, you know. But hopefully in a couple more months I'll have another addition to this series. I think this is the third one I've done now, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, a big big thank you to Anthony Salinas for the thumbnail for this video. He's an amazing talent, and as always, be sure to check him out via the links in the description below. If you did enjoy this video, then be sure to show your appreciation by grabbing that like button, taking it out for a nice seafood dinner, and then smashing the fudge out of it. Until next time guys, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.